welcome to the episode 12 of our podcast. Uh, as usual, Sanjeev is with me today. Come back uh, number 12. That means we've been at it for a year, Asankar. Exactly, exactly. And uh, it was consistent that we uh, released an episode per each month. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, it's a good uh, milestone. Cool. Yeah, so uh, we thought of uh, discuss about modernization because uh, it's a hot topic as well as most of the enterprises are going through this exercise. Either they are in the uh, modernization exercise, so they are planning that. Uh, so we picked that as a uh, topic for today. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, you know this is an important word and important uh, phrase that people have to use almost consistently. So the concept of modernization is an important one to talk about. Exactly, and I think uh, uh, sometimes uh, we see uh, some organizations are treating this as a project, like with a fixed time, fixed cost um, uh, to deliver. Uh, but uh, what we have identified, it's not a project, it's a journey because uh, same principles applying here as well that you have to be iterative and then you have to keep on uh, doing this exercise because one uh, business requirements are changing, uh, business challenges are coming to the technical teams um, as well as uh, that uh, you have to address various things inside the enterprise because enterprise uh, is a, a complex adaptive system. So uh, it's a journey. I think that's a very important point because uh, when, when you modernize, obviously you're modernizing to at best to the current state of the world. So if you modernize today, by tomorrow, you're already legacy to some level. So, so modernization is not a concept that can say, okay, now I'm modern, I'm all good, right? It never ends, basically. So that is why it is a, it is a journey, not a project where you can say, well, okay, modernization is done, now we're all modern, all good, now we can forget about it. It's something basically that says you are, your modernization mindset and modernization approach has to be about reinventing yourself, sort of disrupting yourself and constantly looking to become up to date. Exactly. And I think uh, uh, there's another slight confusion in the industry about uh, digital transformation and modernization as well, uh, because um, digital transformation uh, was the exercise that people were doing, but now uh, they are looking at modernization. But then again, there's a synergy in between these two uh, because um, uh, the modernization is part of the larger digital transformation initiative. Uh, so um, I think uh, uh, looking at that synergy as well as the connection is pretty important as well. Yeah, I, I, so digital transformation, uh, my mental model is transformation was about getting to being a digital business at all, which means running various uh, processes, procedures, systems internally, digitally, offering digital products, might be you know might be simple, as simple as a web app or a mobile app or APIs, or whatever the right thing is, use, utilizing data better. All these things are part of digital transformation. Uh, and of course, digital transformation refers to primarily to companies who are not so digital or not enough digital and getting to becoming digital. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a problem that doesn't go away because there are always transformation initiatives you have to run. But this conversation we're having is about not just transforming to being digital, but about getting to, um, even if you did transformation efforts some time ago, how do you continuously leverage and get better and get more modern? Term again. Exactly. Yeah, so when we are doing the uh, prep uh, or having a chat before we press the record button, uh, you mentioned something really important. It's about, it's not just modernization, it's digital modernization. I think uh, it's a pretty cool even, I like that because uh, everything is digital. So what we are modif modernizing is a, a digital modernization as well. Uh, so I think uh, if you can elaborate a little bit, I think that will be really cool because uh, I really like the term digital modernization. Yeah, I think digital modernization, uh, uh, obviously when you say modernization, it can include everything from, you know, managing power systems to how you do all kinds of stuff. 
And our focus and, and the technology powered initiative is all about digital modernization. And the idea of getting to a modern digital infrastructure is all about saying, how do I operate these things in a cost efficient way? How do I reduce risk? How do I manage various digital infrastructure, which is the lifeblood of the of a business now? And doing it in a way that is consistently modern because both customers want the best possible digital experience and you can't do that without using whatever the latest approaches that people are pushing. Uh, and employees also want to operate in a uh, workplace which is properly modern. Nobody wants to work in a company which is very legacy inside the company either because it's boring. Exactly. Yeah. So I think the, the um, uh, when modernization uh, uh, exercises are starting uh, a lot of architects and then technical teams are thinking it's just uh, about the technology but uh, if we step back and uh, have a look at what are the drivers for uh, this modernization uh, yes there are technical uh, activities you have to do but those are linked with uh, some business impact end of the day what you are doing helping the business to improve and then get more and more opportunities now if you uh, look at most of the uh, enterprises either they are looking for some cost saving uh, looking to do some optimization uh, how they can reduce the risk security compliance and uh, end of the day, looking for a business agility, either to create new business opportunities or optimize the current uh, uh, business op opportunities and then increase the value of the organization. Absolutely. Uh, because digital modernization is not about technology, as you said very clearly and correctly. It's about the business becoming digitally modern. And the business being able to apply modern digital approaches, technologies, practices, whatever the right thing is to create new value for customers and for the business. And it's a comprehensive package of the benefits that you must deliver from it. You cannot be saying, well, you know, we're nice and cool now. We use Kubernetes and we use microservices. That's all nice, but what does it mean for the business is important to deliver. Otherwise, nobody will care. Right? Yeah, exactly. And like uh, to uh, when you have these drivers, uh, organizations are taking different type of approaches or patterns. I know personally you don't like patterns and then it took a while for me to understand uh, the rationale behind that as well. But now I am treating uh, the pattern is basically a pattern plus the context is what required, right? Because there's a context you need to apply not just blindly taking a pattern and uh, implement inside the organization. That context is what missing in uh, most cases. Uh, and uh, we have seen that a bunch of uh, uh, different type of styles or patterns these organizations are using. And then again, um, you can't copy another organization. You can kind of get some best practices, uh, but um, it's uh, really important to understand where you are today uh, where you want to be like immediately and then identify what type of a style that you had to apply uh, when it comes to digital modernization as well. I, I think, I think so maybe I should explain why I don't generally mm -hmm. like the word pattern. Um, so, I, I, so patterns, patterns are a way of saying, well, you don't have to reinvent everything. I've seen this before. I know what to do wonderfully important thing to do because you don't really need to reinvent everything. It's a waste of time and effort to reinvent stuff. <clears throat> At the same time, when you go to, uh, if you're building a building, um, a, a brilliant architect doesn't look at the previous projects they've done and say, well, you know, I, I, I'm just going to apply that pattern here. They, they, this, that's what you meant by context, right? They, they exactly. listen very carefully and they understand, they look at the nature, look at the environment and look at the problem that you're trying to solve, what kind of experience are people going to experience from this building or facility. And then you create something that is perfectly tuned for that place. Of course, they don't go reinvent stuff like, okay, how many you know bathrooms should you have in this building if there are a thousand people in this building, right? You shouldn't reinvent that. So there, yeah. absolutely, you need to apply the pattern. So there is a point at which patterns have to be applied. 
But if you unleash patterns too early to people, everybody will think I can become a brilliant architect, you know, and build building because I've seen the patterns that everybody else uses, just meant to cut and paste and put them together. And you won't get a nice, a nice building or a nice facility out of that. You'll get something, but it won't be nice. It won't be brilliant or beautiful. Uh, and that elegance comes from judgment, which is coming from understanding the context and experience and so on. So, so patterns are very important, but then, uh, and, and there is a point at which you absolutely must apply the pattern. You know, if you're building something complex, you don't go debate what's the thickness of the concrete, you would just mathematical formula to calculate that. What's the reinforcement you need to put? These are all well understood things. So you apply those rules and you're done. Right? You don't need reinvent. So, yeah. So I think we spoke about uh, reasoning by analogy and reasoning by first principles during last episode as well. Yeah. So all these are linked uh, um, uh, together. So I think uh, uh, if you go back to the, the modernization styles, uh, so uh, one and most common thing that we have seen is uh, re-hosting or uh, people call it as uh, lift and shift that you take the workloads as it is and then move to a more modern infrastructure uh, in the current uh, uh, context, basically uh, how you move from your data center into a cloud environment is one example, or like uh, from uh, traditional virtual machine environment to a more containerized environment, but without changing the code base, without changing the architecture, you take the workloads as it is and move to that new environment. Yeah, so, so when you look at digital modernization, digital systems have layers of stuff, right? There's, yeah. there's, there's the hardware, there's the VMs or the containers or whatever, there's the application code, there may be various bits of middleware, all these things that are there all the way to front ends and, and APIs and so on. Uh, so lift and shift uh, is addressing one aspect of that problem, which is, okay, I want to go from boxes in my building to boxes over there. No problem, right? Lift and shift. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a very good way to do it, and it reduces some costs, increases some costs, but it's an effective approach for solving certain problems. Exactly. Yeah. So then the uh, uh, the, the second style that uh, we have seen, uh, uh, improved version or like going to the next level, that you don't just take uh, exactly what it is, uh, uh, just modify uh, to uh, optimize the new environment uh, that people call it as replatform or lift and reshape and uh, uh, do the minimum changes that you require to adjust to the new environment. And sometimes uh, that uh, we used to call it like uh, put lipstick to a pig uh, or you encapsulate uh, uh, the uh, legacy stuff and then put um, APIs or the modern stuff around that include in this exercise as well. Again, works for some of the organizations and uh, 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 a very valid pattern as well. Yeah, the thing that I think everybody has to keep in mind is uh, digital modernization doesn't necessarily deliver immediate business value because it's about creating future agility, future ability to uh, do better things and so on as well. So in some cases, just lifting it and reshaping it a little bit so you can actually create that value by putting some lipstick on that pig, putting APIs, getting some governed experiences. That's enough to justify the next step. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so next style is where I think architects will heavily involve uh, that's basically you rebuild, uh, you rewrite, redesign uh, the entire system. And then there's a nice pattern called strangler pattern as well that you take uh, small chunks from uh, that uh, entire monolithic system and then uh, modify it. Uh, so architecture styles like microservice architecture, cell architecture um, are helping uh, to do this exercise that how you can gradually uh, rewrite uh, this entire system. Yeah, so, so my my my, uh, my approach for something like this is basically uh, if you are going to redesign, rebuild, uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, linear algebra and orthogonal thinking. <laughs> so I, I I would take the domain and partition it into orthogonal dimensions, and then you start designing for each one. So from first principles, ideally for each each dimension that you're operating in. 
then you end up with a software architecture that can, can solve any problem that you have within the scope of that n-dimensional space. I know that's a very simplified way of thinking about it, but but it helps you clean your mind and think in those terms. When you think in terms of, okay, let, let me organize the designs. And domain-driven design, in some sense, is an aspect of that because domains are essentially saying, hey, I, I'll just isolate this space and this space is independent from that space. I can innovate independently. So it is an orthogonal decomposition approach. Uh, it's not the only approach, but it's certainly an approach and it's a good approach. So I think, yeah, this kind of rebuild, rewrite, redesign approaches, uh, obviously they're more costly because now it takes more time, you need more people um, and you don't see ROI for a while, which means your people who are funding it have to be committed to it, all those challenges. Yeah, I think in that exercise, uh, bringing a complete new team will not work because you made a really important point about the domain. And then uh, to have proper domains and then redesign it and rewrite, you need the domain knowledge as well. So there can be uh, some skills uh, that you might need uh, in the modernization uh, exercise, but uh, uh, having the existing teams are really important because they are the uh, people who know about how the system did work and then what are the uh, business requirements and uh, what type of dependencies these systems are having. So uh, creating those uh, agile teams by combining uh, the existing teams and then bringing uh, new skills is uh, really important um, when it comes to rewrite. Yeah, I, I, I think it comes to that... Um... A mindset of saying empowerment hmm. versus a um, versus saying I'm just going to find somebody else to do this. So people have to feel like individually at an individual level at a team level, they don't want to become legacy. They want to improve. They want to get to whatever the right way of doing things as to the best of the understanding of that day. And that mindset comes from giving people the experience, the opportunity, the empowerment to actually operate properly, right? Otherwise, uh, uh, there was an analogy. Uh, is that, uh, uh, there's a Right now, there's a strike going on in the U.S. East Coast ports, right? And, yeah. and the, the Longshoremen's Association or something. And they are, one of their positions is we don't want automation because the way the compensation model works, they don't want automation. And I saw a tweet about, I can't remember it was Sweden or some other country some years ago when they were some another kind of automation change like containers coming in or something like that. I can't remember what, what the detail was, but a, there was a good point there that said the way that had been adopted was because the positioning had been, we are not going to protect the current process, but we're going to protect the people. The people will have jobs in the new universe, in the new way of doing things, so they don't need to worry about it but the current process can be improved. So you empower the people to think creatively and adopt modernization, in that case, shipping modernization or digital modernization, right? Yeah. Versus if you put them into a spot where they feel like, okay, this new thing will come and take me out of the loop, they're gonna pull every plug to make sure that it doesn't happen. Yeah. Now, strike is an extreme plug to pull, but in, in a digital environment, there are lots of plugs current people can pull to make sure the new, new project fails. So it's very important to have ownership from the old team and the new team as being together. Exactly. Yeah. So the, the last but not least, the uh, another pattern is replaced. Sometimes people might think it's anti-pattern, but no, it's kind of a legit pattern uh, based on uh, the, uh, the system that you are uh, trying to modernize. Uh, so some people, they uh, pick like uh, some uh, code system or like they bring a SaaS system and especially things like uh, more commodity uh, related services or uh, functionality that you can easily replace. And then again, uh, you can, if it is available as a SaaS uh, service, I think getting it will be more beneficial than you can mainly focus on the unique experiences that you can build around that particular system. So uh, it's another important way uh, that architects should consider uh, when it comes to modernization. Yeah, I, I, absolutely right. I, I think it comes to uh, you know that business theory about core versus context. If I am a bank, if I'm an insurance company, if I'm a shipping company, if I'm a healthcare company, um, you know, Salesforce is the best example to use for this stuff. 
doing CRM well is not core to being that company, right? Yeah. It is just context. So going to a SaaS offering for CRM made absolute sense because uh, now I can forget about that. This, the, those guys are responsible for giving me the best of CRM for the rest of future. Um, and I can focus on being a bank or an insurance company or a manufacturer or whatever the thing that I, I am. And that's what replacing with a SaaS or COP system, off-the-shelf system means. It's that you, you get to get get stuff off your head and say, I don't have to think about it. It's just going to work. Right? Now, obviously, you need to get the right thing. You need to get the right kind of security. There's a bunch of, you know, it's not as simple as placing something, but but that allows you to offload a ton of stuff off your head. Go into Google, Google Workspace or Microsoft Office 365 eliminates the challenges with collaboration. You don't think about it anymore. It just works. So that's the advantage that you get from this. Exactly. So uh, overall, if you look at, uh, there are two approaches uh, that we see, like kind of a horizontal approach that you replace uh, layer by layer or system by system. And then there's another approach, uh, kind of a vertical approach that you take a complete application. What are the touch points for that particular application and try to modernize it? Both are valid uh, approaches. Only thing uh, we need to look at uh, what are the dependencies. As example, now an organization might think I'll move all my data into a, a cloud uh, database. But if the applications are running um, uh, on-prem, uh, then what's the latency and then how you can mitigate uh, those type of challenges. Uh, those kind of things need to be considered. Again, um, in a larger enterprise, different teams are involved as well. So having a more enterprise architecture approach and enterprise architecture planning uh, is really important uh, when you get into uh, digital modernization. Otherwise, one part of the organization will modernize, but the rest will not. And uh, there will be uh, additional issues rather than the benefits that they are getting uh, from a modernization exercise if you don't plan it uh, in that way uh, without having a holistic view. Yeah, the, the, you know, there are more, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? And, and in a large enough organization, there are many cats have to be skinned. I hope there are no cat lovers who get upset. I'm not <laughs> recommending skinning any cats. Um, but a, absolutely correct. I mean, there, there are there are things we have, we have one large customer right now which has gone through a management change, and part of their new mandate is to horizontalize much more. Right? They were very vertically organized. Now they can horizontalize because that they see as a way of cost effective execution, both digitally and non digitally. Um, and 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 then then at that point you also get a chance to modernize because instead of just taking whatever the existing infrastructure. And horizontalizing that, you also get a chance to maybe it is containerization, maybe it's microservices or the right level of service abstractions, whatever the right approaches that you're trying to modernize to, uh, this gives you an opportunity. And yeah, uh, I think the dependency comment you made us is very important because uh, you're changing tires in a in a fast moving truck, right? So you can't uh, you know you you can't you can't stop the world, you can't break anything, you can't. Uh, that's very challenging. Uh, that brings to my mind a funny, funny video I've seen uh, again on X. I think uh, there's some kind of a, a, a three-wheel or took competition. I think it's in Sri Lanka in India, where there's a video of the guy changing the tire while the took is going, and the one guy is driving with one, the took at like a 40-degree angle, balancing it perfectly, and somebody's leaning over and changing the tire. That's what one day is. So next level of a pit stop in uh, Formula One. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, these uh, different styles are there, different approaches are there, but uh, having that enterprise architecture approach will help. Uh, but then again, there are challenges always, right? Like, uh, so we need to um, like face those challenges. Like uh, one thing is cost because uh, it's costly uh, to do any change, uh, the time commitment, and then you might not have the skills now, especially now uh, most of the organizations are moving to Kubernetes and um, then everything has to be uh, rewritten or reorganized the way that the Kubernetes ecosystem is working. And then some people consuming service measures, uh, those type of uh, technology advancements are coming and you need to <clears throat> 
kind of get the correct uh, skill set uh, to do that. And then, uh, as you explained earlier, the resistance, right? Like this people factor is really important on how you can manage that resistance uh, coming within the organization. And then uh, without like uh, uh, reducing the uh, innovation, because now you might be focusing on modernization, then what is going to happen uh, for the innovation happening inside the organization? So how you can balance that as well as bring the business stability because sometimes business teams might not like this. Even there are benefits uh, because uh, it might not provide a stable system for a while. So I think architects, they have a bigger role to look at these challenges and plan a, a modernization uh, exercise properly. Absolutely. It's not a, you know, digital modernization is not, not an easy task. I mean, you've gone through Many of the challenges that people will have when you try to more digitally modernize the business, uh, the long-term return is worth it because otherwise your your tech debt cost keeps going up, and the infrastructure cost keeps going up. The ability to find skilled skilled people will become challenged as as the technology starts waning and you're still on some infrastructure that doesn't exist anymore. So there are all kinds of challenges that come from not doing it as well. While so that that's uh, you know to be a good uh, I can't remember I think it was my PhD advisor who told me to be a good professor you have to be a good salesman because to be a good professor basically means you need to be able to raise money all the time right actually both be a good salesman and a good CEO because you have run a little company uh, to have a team of people do the work and then you're out there selling and making money basically that's what an academic research person does it's kind of depressing thought but that's the reality of the situation and and so to be a good architect you got to be a salesman. You have to be able to sell your ideas to the business, sell, uh, sell, get people to buy in saying this is worth it. Exactly. I think uh, Gregor Hobbs, uh, he wrote this book called Architect, uh, Architect Elevator. Uh, there are really good points about exactly what you uh, explain about how you should uh, look at it from the business point of view and then how you should uh, sell your architecture and the uh, uh, technology advancements in a business sense and then uh, sell it to the business because it's a challenge that most of the architects are facing um, to get approval and then get the budget uh, associated with that. Yeah, I think uh, we are coming to our favorite topic, platform, actually, because the platform is playing a role in modernization uh, because uh, having a, a, a proper platform will expedite the modernization as well as reduce the, some of the risks that associate uh, with modernization as well. Uh, so I think uh, it's pretty important to consider a platform uh, in uh, digital modernization. Yeah, it, it, it's not just platform. It is also to have the platform disappear from focus. The point of digital yes. modernization is not to be building platforms for yourself. I'm an insurance company. I should build an insurance platform, yeah. not a platform that helps me build software or run Kubernetes or whatever. That stuff is commodity at, at, if I'm an insurance company. right? So it's very, very important that, and just like we were talking about the co versus context and being able to take things out so one of the context things that you should try very hard to take out are things that are not related to the business at hand. I know if you're a technical architect and you're, you're most of us, uh, me included, uh, uh, getting down to the details and getting down to the low level is fun. It's a lot more fun than working at this sort of application level. Yeah. But from a business point of view, it is not what the business needs because it, a, the lower levels are very, very important because the low levels are not good. Nothing will work up there. But uh, spending time and money of in every business spending time on the lower level is is uh, is not core. It's context. So if it's context, you need to get out of it. That means you need to have a platform that is there but is not in your focus, in your in your eyesight, not bothering you. It just lets you do what you need to do, which is platformless. A platformless exactly. platform. Yeah. I think those are connected to the purpose and what actually matter, right? So I think yeah. uh, understanding those things, it takes time, I think. Uh, as you said, like uh, dealing with low-level stuff are really fun and gradually we uh, get into those things. But at the end of the day, yes, we need to feed into the value stream and then have the business. So Sanjeev, I think um, 
we can't ignore AI because uh, an AI uh, ha- it got a bigger role in the modernization as well. Uh, so shall we a little bit touch based on that? Because one thing is about AI augmented software engineering um, that can be part of uh, this exercise and uh, expedite the modernization tasks. Yeah, absolutely. Can't talk about anything without AI these days. So, uh, but but AI in this case actually is magically, potentially magically impactful. Uh, take something like taking your COBOL code and and moving it into say ballerina because you know it's the best language now, right? Uh, a, you could get an LLM to do that work a big chunk of it, and that's something it was impossible before. You would need to hire people and get that going. Now it won't it won't necessarily give you. Uh, mathematically correct transformation at this point. So you have to go through it, which, which is not an easy task. Um, so, so there is everything from AI-assisted software engineering to AI being able to be an agent. That's the next level. Of, that's what everybody's talking about these days, right? The, yeah. the agent approach for AI where essentially you now have people being AI, a role being played by AI. Uh, that's obviously a... a uh, delicate topic. This is again touching back on the strike. That is partly why they are striking. So we don't want to be replaced by AI. Yeah. Right? So so and the same will happen within within business. Uh, but there are there are things that uh, that people do which is not useful in terms of time and cost and productivity and maintaining skill and interest and all that stuff that a robotic or an AI um, system can just do without. You know, it doesn't get tired, right? It doesn't get bored. It just can do the same thing over and over again. So, so I think this is a big challenge: uh, finding the right level of adoption of AI, and also AI is still in its infancy. We are in whatever AI summer version four or something. Yeah. Uh, whether we'll hit another AI winter or not, I don't know. Uh, uh, but AI, the current approach for this Gen AI approach, uh, uh, there will be a lot more coming yet. We are still in the first phase of the new Gen AI era, the Gen AI era, not the new Gen AI era. And so there'll be lots of, you know, early adopter pitfalls that you have as well. So depending on where the company that you're working in is, if it's a company that is happy to take early adopter risk, there are lots of stuff you can do right now. But then yeah. there are others who are a little bit more conservative and who want to be more time, you know, more, more like, okay, show me something that has actually worked. Uh, then, then you will probably wait longer. But still, I think it's a it's an area that you cannot ignore, and you need to learn. You need to try, and very important to see what aspect of modernization can be delivered uh, with AI or, or with the support of AI. Yeah, and I think uh, when it comes to digital experiences that you are delivering, uh, AI-driven applications are important as well. But to deliver AI applications and build AI-driven applications, again, you need some kind of modernization as well. So starting this journey early will help you to uh, reach that uh, target at some point. Yeah, that's a very good point because AI agents can't work unless there are APIs. It needs the tools for the agent to work. Yeah. Tools are APIs. So if you're if you're in a you know pre API enterprise, you can't leverage AI beyond just documents. To leverage AI with your systems, you need to introduce APIs. Yeah. Another key point, key key reason for why you need to become an API first kind of business, so that everything is available for these new software systems to go and go pull data and interact and can be try and contribute transactions as well going forward. Yeah. So it's a really interesting conversation about digital modernization. I think this, again, this is just a start uh, of this conversation. So we will get into detail uh, of each and every aspect, as well as uh, we'll try to bring industry experts uh, uh, to join us uh, to discuss uh, this topic in the future episodes as well. Um, so thank you for joining. And then we'll uh, come up with another topic in uh, our next episode. So stay tuned. Thank you very much, guys. Nice to see you all again. Thank you.